Welcome, everybody. My name is Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word, a brand new museum of words and language in the historic Franklin School at 13th and K in downtown DC. We are open. We, for a while, we're doing these virtual programs instead of in-person <laughs> visits, but now you can come see us. Uh, we are open Thursdays through Sundays from 10 to 5. Admission is free. Um, and if you are a member of Planet Word, that support is incredibly important. It's one of the reasons we are able to keep admission free. So if you found out about this program from our member newsletter or some other communication where you follow us, thank you very much for that kind of support. Um, if you are not a member and would like to become one, we'd be more than happy to help you with that. Um, we do ask people to reserve advanced passes and those get snatched up pretty quickly. Uh, but we do have a pretty consistent no-show rate as all free passes do. So don't be afraid to walk up. We pretty much always have walk-up tickets available. I can't think of a time we've turned walk-ups away. So we encourage you to come visit Thursday through Sunday 10 to 5. And if you're not in Washington or just not ready to go to museums yet, uh, we do have a robust virtual programming curriculum of which tonight's program is a part. So thank you very much for joining us for that. I think that's all the housekeeping. I think we can get started now. I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, Katie Booth is a writer. Her new book is called, oh, Zoom backgrounds don't help with this, The Invention of Miracles. The subtitle is Language, Power, and Alexander Graham Bell's Quest to End Deafness. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, and we are also joined by William Ennis and Brian Greenwald. They are both professors at Gallaudet here in Washington. Um, they are both historians um, and uh, have participated in this conversation about Bell's legacy and language and power. Um, and so we are delighted to have you both here today, Dr. Ennis and Dr. Greenwald, thank you for being here. So Katie, I want to start with you because your new book is sort of our excuse for having this conversation, not that it's not timely at, at other moments, um, but what spurred you to look into Bell's legacy and particularly the point of view you take on his legacy in this book? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so I grew up in a family of hereditary deafness. Um, my grandparents were deaf. My great grandparents, my great aunts and uncles were all deaf for two generations. Um, and I, my grandparents lived right down the street from me. So I spent my days with them. I saw them all the time. We were a very close family. Uh, and also my aunts and or my aunt and uncles um, also very close. And so I grew up with sign language and deaf culture literally right down the street. Um, and I started signing before I learned to speak, which is pretty common in those worlds. Um, and I also sort of watched how the world treated my family. Um, and as I got older, I learned about oralism, which is a type of education that Bell promoted um, and that my family was educated under. And what that is, is um, it's a way of educating deaf people that prohibits the use of sign language and punishes the use of sign language and advocates for the use of speech and English um, in all elements, in all parts of the education. Because my family had hereditary deafness, it meant that when they went to school, um, they were prohibited from using a language they already knew and forced to communicate in a language they didn't have easy access to, which was really difficult for my grandmother and my aunts and uncles. Um, and my grandfather was, my grandfather grew up in a different family. He grew up in a, in a hearing family who loved him very much, but didn't know a whole lot about how deaf education could work and sent him to an oralist school. They did not know sign language. And the education was so difficult for him that he didn't learn any language until his 20s uh, when he started going to deaf clubs. So he graduated from school not having learned sign, which was prohibited, um, and also not learning English, which was inaccessible to him. 
Um, and so I grew up with these two influences, two different experiences of oralism, but both of them very, very difficult. Um, and ultimately it was, it was my grandmother's death uh, in a hospital where she could not access interpreters or information about her own illness. Um, and we did not even know she was there. Nobody contacted our family for several days. She just was there with no information all alone. And that happened when I was about 18. And it was, um, the story of that is how my book begins. It was so, uh, I don't even know the word, heartbreaking, um, shocking, devastating, and I couldn't figure out how to move past it. Uh, and that was when I started looking at how did sign language become so devalued in our culture? Uh, and that led me to Bell. Before you started looking into it, did you associate oralism with Bell? Yes. Oh, oh yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, um, in the deaf world, Bell is known. Uh, he's a known figure. Um, he's seen as, at least for many people, not everyone, not Brian, um, but for many people seen as an enemy. And that's how I learned of him. Um, somebody who was responsible for a lot of harm that deaf people were experiencing. Once my research started, that image started to change and become more complex. But in the beginning, I saw him simply as the enemy. And Brian, how was your experience different? The first thing I wanna say is thank you, Katie, for sharing such a powerful story. And I can see how painful that experience truly was. When I think about my journey, I think that Alexander Graham Bell has always been a part of my life. Uh, I was born into a hearing family as the only deaf person, and I did not use sign language growing up. I was educated in a system of oralism when I was young. My family would always sit around the dinner table having conversations, and those experiences led me to always be behind in the conversation. I could never follow well what was being said, what was being talked about. And at dinner time, my dad often had these trivia contests that he would do. Like, you know, what's the capital of Wyoming? Or who invented the light bulb? Or who invented the telephone? And the answer was A.G. Bell, you got that right. And then my dad would share a little bit about his story, about his life. And he said, you know, Bell's wife was deaf and I, took away from that, wow, he had a deaf wife, just like I'm deaf. And so growing up, I really envisioned Belle in a very positive light because that was what I had learned in my family. And then when I was about 12 or 13, I went to the Clark School for the Deaf in Massachusetts, which is an oral school in Western Massachusetts. And Bell was actually chair of the board of trustees at that school for a while. And Clark School was very proud of Bell's involvement in their school. They were very open about that. And I lived in a dorm that was actually called Bell Hall. So with all of that, growing up both at home and at the Clark School, the name Belle's name was everywhere to be seen. And everything that I learned about Belle in both of those environments was very positive. I was unaware of his involvement with eugenics or the other controversial components of his history. I just simply wasn't aware of those things. It wasn't until after I had graduated from high school when I went to Gallaudet for college, I went to Gallaudet University, and at Gallaudet University was the first time when I learned about the strong critiques against Bell. And truly I was shocked. It contradicted everything I had learned about Bell growing up. 
And it really threw me for a loop. And there were very strong critiques out there at Gallaudet. And so I had these two different viewpoints opposing that were at odds. So since then, I have done more studies about Bell and his involvement in the eugenics movement. So I would say that I had grown up with Bell essentially my whole life in a certain sense. And I should say, um, when we publicized that we were going to have this conversation, we did get a statement from the Alexander and Mabel Bell Legacy Foundation. They dispute um, some of these issues we're talking about. They dispute Bell's involvement with eugenics or that he tried to suppress sign language. Um, if anybody wants to find out more about their position, I encourage them to go to the Legacy Foundation directly. But William Ennis, what is the controversy here? Why are people disputing what Bell stood for? Certainly. Uh, well, my experience with Bell started in graduate school. I grew up in a deaf family. My parents are deaf. We never discussed, uh, discussed Bell, didn't discuss the phone, the invention. Really, I knew nothing about his background, didn't know he was involved in the deaf world at all. In my graduate studies, I began researching Bell and learned more about him and learned about his involvement with the eugenics movement. So to be honest, I really can't discuss the deaf community and eugenics without Bell. He is just at the forefront. So he's, he's always part of that conversation. So that's striking for me. To me, you know, when we talk about Bell and you talk about eugenics, uh, Brian can go into this more deeply, but again, I'm, he was involved with the eugenics. There's, there's no separating them. But when we talk now about autism, which is what my research focuses on, really trying to tease out what oralism is, what eugenics is, what oralism is. So when we think about Bell, It, it, it's in his genes, right? It, it, you can't separate it out. For example, banning deaf marriage. He did have a comment, a statement on it and a position on it. And he told students that he wasn't going to interfere with their marriages. However, at the same time, he advocated for oralism. And he knew he'd win that battle another way, right? Because because then you had hearing parents who didn't know anything about deaf culture. And so whether he was successful with deaf individuals and eugenics with adults didn't really matter because he had a stronger influence on hearing parents and their deaf children. So he influenced it that way. He knew that they weren't, the children weren't going to be able to argue with the parents. They weren't going to be able to counter what he was saying so he could win the parents over and therefore he'd win the argument. So he didn't push very hard in one way and yet he did, right? So teasing out those two issues, they are completely overlapped, but looking at those two issues separately is part of what I do. So for those of us who are not particularly familiar with deaf culture, why is oralism antithetical to deaf culture? Why is it not just another alternative communication? How is sign and deaf culture intertwined in a way more than just about language? And Brian, I'd like to start with you on that. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, the first thing that I would like to say about that is that we're talking about two fundamentally different educational philosophies. So oralism, at least in America, is the idea that deaf people will learn to speak, they will learn to lip read, and they will be prohibited from learning American Sign Language or signing. In the 1830s is when oralism came into the scene in America in schools for the deaf. And there were two schools that were founded in 1867 that focused on oralism as a philosophy, the Clark School for the Deaf being one and the Lexington School being the other. 
and they emphasized that deaf children would live in dorms, eat together, sleep together all day, every day, being educated in a philosophy in classrooms and in dorms, all of the socialization, all of the education would take place exclusively in spoken English with no American Sign Language. And then on the opposing side, there were deaf children going to schools for the deaf who were learning to use American Sign Language. And most of the children in those schools had hearing parents and learned their language interacting with other deaf students at the school. So sign language was used in the classroom, socially in the dorms, and it created a critical mass of deaf people who would live near a school for the deaf. And there would be these vibrant deaf communities deaf newspapers, deaf clubs, deaf organizations in these areas where deaf schools existed. And that's really the impetus for these collective deaf communities evolving. And so I think when we talk about deaf people today and the legacy of Bell, I think that legacy serves as a lightning rod of sorts. For a lot of deaf people, whether we're talking about present day or in the past, they grew up in environments where oralism dominated their educational experiences, their social experiences, their family life experiences. That lack of being able to be a full participant, to have full access in all of those situations Really, we're talking about the ideology being embedded in the United States and spreading. And so it's not just a simple matter of pointing a finger at a system or pointing a finger at one person who was very active. I mean, Alexander Graham Bell did play a big role in this, but there was such a strong influence Oralism had such a strong power as an ideological philosophy. If I can add to what Brian just said, a successful oral student, if they went through the program and they left, they would never sign. They would use spoken English or spoken language and they would lip read perfectly and they would never socialize with deaf people. That was a success story. Well, and also they would only interact with hearing people, lip reading, using spoken language. And they certainly would never marry a deaf person. Then what also would make sure their deaf or their children wouldn't be involved in the deaf community at all, right? They were completely integrated into the hearing society. It doesn't matter if we're deaf or hearing, right? It's not easy to, to uh, have that separation, but Brian really shines the spotlight on the irony. He grew up oral. He failed. You know, he had his hearing family. He went to mainstream school. He went to an oral school. The unfortunate irony of oralism, the goal is to integrate into hearing society. And most deaf people, their experiences, they can't. They can't even integrate into their own family. So that's where we see this divide, right? When we talk about culture and sign language, that interaction, interacting with deaf people, being within community, marrying a deaf person, marrying people within your own culture and your community, being able to communicate, that's so different. And that's the huge divide. And if I could just weigh in briefly adding to that as a follow-up to Billy's point here. I went to the Clark School in Massachusetts and there was something there that always fascinated me. Even as a student there, I met several alumni at that time who were in their 70s and their 80s. And when they came to campus, almost all of the alumni used sign language, even though they might have grown up going to the Clark School themselves upon graduation, almost all of them learned to sign. And I think that illustrates this irony that Billy is talking about. I think that's so, a really common story. I mean, my family all went, most of my family went to the Clark School and they all, if they didn't begin signing, they signed in the end. I think that's that's a story you hear all the time, all the time. 
So Katie, since you grew up bilingual, mm -hmm. um, I, I think for those of us who don't sign and we're a word museum, so I'd like to kind of understand the linguistics of ASL a little bit in terms of, it's not a verbatim transcription of English. No. It is a distinct language that has distinctions like all different languages, right? So help us understand a little bit about how ASL is not just a, a different way to communicate and how it is integrated into sort of deaf pride and deaf culture. I mean, and I will, I'll have to defer to also um, Billy and Brian if I say something not quite right. I'm no longer completely fluent in ASL. I can, I'm conversational, but um, I rely a lot in many ways on the patience and kindness of deaf people, um, including in my language. Um, but I, I mean, it's, it's fundamentally different. It's, it's been said that, I mean, over and over again, like ASL is as different from English as Japanese. I mean, it is, it is n not the same language. It's linguistic structures are different. Um, it's word order is different. Uh, it has a way of layering information that I think to someone who doesn't understand a lot about the language and is only thinking in terms of words having meaning, it might look simplistic. But the truth is that there's all of these other elements, elements like facial expression, body language, pacing, um, tiny, tiny little things that express so much more in ASL than they do in just a regular spoken language. Um, I had a friend once ask me how to sign the sentence, this, or what the word or order would be for the sentence. It was snowing, the snow fell slowly and gently or something like that. And it was weird to realize that there was no word order. Um, there was just snow and it had to do with the way your face looked, the, the pacing of the snow falling. But to an onlooker who isn't paying attention to all of the complexities of language um, in, in a signed language, it could look simplistic. It could look like caveman speak, you know, like snow. And that's the end of this, the sentence. Um, and I think that's how linguists, if they looked at sign language at all, it's, that's how they understood it until you know the 1980s or 60s wait when somebody help me uh the 50s is probably when you're looking for the <laughs> 1950s thank you um but it, it began it be, it began slowly. the late six the late 50s yeah yeah it began slowly um and then a number of the the linguist who's usually credited is william stokey but he also brought in a lot of other researchers, deaf researchers, deaf researchers were doing this work. Um, and we began to understand all of the layers of sign language. But I will say that th there was a lot of messaging that sign language was simplistic and primitive. And there was also a lot of internalized attitudes. Um, my, my family didn't believe that sign was a very complex language because they had been told their whole lives that it was primitive, that it was just gestures, that it wasn't complicated. Um, but I want to give Billy or Brian a chance to, you know, add anything that I might have, or, 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 or correct anything. I think with Stokey, um, Bill Stokey, he was an English professor at Gallaudet University, hearing gentleman. Uh, he had not signed previously, but before coming to Gallaudet, didn't, wasn't involved in the deaf culture, but it was him who recognized when deaf people were signing that it was a language. And interesting, interestingly enough, uh, the power, when we talk about power, this power of oralism, even within the deaf community, 
So when Stokey started doing his research and started finding out and explaining to deaf people themselves that ASL was a complex language, that it wasn't a form of signed English, deaf people were offended. They said, my English is quite fine, thank you. There were these misperceptions. This was, deaf people were very sensitive to being critiqued on their English. And so there was a misperception and misunderstanding of what was being said. And it, it took quite a while before people realized that it had nothing to do with English and that it was in and of itself a true language of equal status. And every time they talked about ASL, deaf people would respond with, no, no, my English is fine. There's no reason to you know, be talking about ASL in this way. And it took a while, even a Gallaudet before people realized and understood and recognized ASL as an official language. But Stokey really began that movement um, and, and was able to research and find the criteria and how it fits a language regardless of its modality. Uh, and obviously research is taken on um, from there. And I see some of the explanations in um, there. So you're right, the power of oralism does continue even within the deaf community, even after the research came out. And Billy, I hope you don't mind uh, if I elaborate just a bit more. Um, you know, based on what Katie and Billy have said here about Stokey, I think there's one piece of this story that led to the growth or development of this matter. When we think about deaf poetry, different performances that have been done, if we think about theater done in American Sign Language, and the way that that has really been shared, you know, even back into the 1920s and 30s when signing wasn't intended to be something that was really open. It was something that deaf people did in secret, but it wasn't done in these open spaces. And so I think there is a big impact there. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, Billy, but even your father, I think, is someone we should call out as a master performer using ASL, making these different pieces of art in powerful and beautiful ways. Not only that, but how deaf pride blossomed and bloomed after Stokey's research, right? In the 60s and 70s, really seeing all of that come to fruition. Yeah, and, and we're not even getting into how ASL differs from other sign languages. I mean, it's a really rich linguistic research opportunity if anybody wants to build on some of that earlier work. It's, um, I think, uh, I think what people miss when they draw an equivalence among ways of communicating is um, exactly what you're all saying, that it's, it's not just a different way of communicating English um, and denying that education to a deaf kid is denying a whole host of other things, not just a communication method. ASL and deaf culture, really the key is deaf people, always has been, right? Deaf people are the eye, right? They're visual, they use their eyes for their language. It's visual, it fits us, it's what we need. It's designed in a way that gets our needs met. We touched a little bit on this idea of power. Um, I think the fundamental question there in a question that comes up a lot about language use is who gets to decide, right? Who has the final say so in what way you communicate? And I think it's really interesting here that although Bell was this towering figure with a huge audience and all the credibility he could possibly ask for, ultimately kids who were educated in oralism just made up their own signs, right? It seems like there was often just a way of subverting that authority because sign was such a more effective communication tool. Yeah, that's right. And Katie, after all the research, and um, I know that as you've been talking about this book, you've gotten some pushback from people who want a different history of Bell out there in the world. Um, how are you feeling about 
your family story about what could have happened differently? How has your thinking evolved? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I have a new appreciation for, I think I, I always knew these ideas were still alive. This, this controversy, this debate was still alive. I have a new appreciation for that now. Um, I think that it's interesting. I can't remember exactly how you worded it, something about how people want a different version of the story of Bell. That story has been out there. That story is, is out there. That's the story most people know, um, most hearing people, right? Uh, and there's this other story that most hearing people don't know. Most deaf people do know it, I think. I think that's safe to say. Um, and I guess, how has my thinking changed? I don't think my thinking has changed. Um, I think that I have taken a huge amount of, um, I have found, I shouldn't say I've taken, I found a huge amount of support and empathy and sharing of stories from deaf people and CODAs, which stands for children of deaf adults who have reached out to me and shared their experiences and their families' experiences of oralism and of the indirect consequences of Bell's legacy as well, like stories about uh, situations in hospitals, things like that. I don't even know if, if saying it's indirect is quite how I want to say it, but I think I think if anything, I, I feel more in community with other people who have experienced this legacy in one way or another. And I, I draw a lot of strength and have a huge amount of appreciation for that. Um, we have several audience questions that I want to get to um, about both uh, ASL and Bell. So um, this says, if sign language is about the I, what happens to deaf blind people like the young Paralympian woman who has Usher's disease? She's deaf and slowly going blind. She quit the Olympics because she was not allowed to bring a personal care assistant to Tokyo to help her. Anyone want to take that answer? I mean, I can talk a little. Oh, um, certainly. With the deaf community is finally. Well, what's the word I want to use? The deaf community has not always historically been inclusive. We have our own uh, isms, racism, ableism, marginalizing other communities. So we are finally seeing much more inclusiveness within our own community. And that includes for deafblind individuals. That hasn't been historically true. We have not always done right by the community, but it is growing, it is expanding. Gallaudet is much more inclusive, more cognizant of deafblind students, their needs, staff members as well. So, right, people often think that even even deafblind people use sign. They might not be using the eye, so to speak, but they're still using sign language and it is something that fits their needs. So signing still fits what their needs are and that relationship is still a strong correlate or there's still that strong correlation. Can I add to that a little? Um, there's also, yeah, there's a lot of deafblind people who are using forms of tactile ASL. There's also another language right now called pro-tactile, which is emerging. It started out in the Pacific Northwest, but it is now throughout the United States. And it is its own unique language that is being disseminated in the deafblind community that is, and it is distinct from um, tactile ASL. So I just wanna clarify that there's, there's two different modalities at least two, probably many and hybrid, all of that. But um, that is also another language that is being used by the deafblind community. And I think it's it one thing that it seeks to address, and I'm 
pulling this knowledge from what I've learned from uh, the poet and essayist and activist John Lee Clark. Uh, but one of the things that it seeks to address is how much of ASL is facial and is part of, and is read on the body in ways that are not always intelligible to the deafblind, uh, to, to deafblind people. And so there's a lot of ways that it moves that information more onto the body in, in a variety of ways, makes it more tactile than visual. Um, this question I'll send to you, Brian. Uh, when did Bell become a controversial figure to the deaf community? I know he lectured at Gallaudet and has an honorary degree, but at some point he became our villain. Was that before or after his death? And when did the myth outsize the man? Yeah, that is a really good question. So when I think about Bell, I think that that controversy was always there in the deaf community, even when he was still alive. I think the key turning point, what really ignited this fire was the deaf formation of the human race. So that was in 1883 that he gave that presentation at the National Academy of Science University. So instead of talking about the mechanics of the telephone in his presentation, he actually spoke about the genetics of deaf people. And in that polemic, he brought up some questions about the reproductive rights of deaf people, specifically about deaf people marrying other deaf people. And so in many ways, that was the moment that ignited the fire of the Bell controversy. And then he became involved in the eugenic movement and that added fuel to the fire in the controversy where people really were against what Bell was speaking about at that time. And then that lasted until his death. And then when we think about the eugenics movement in 1906, it was a very early time in the American eugenics movement, 1906 when Bell got involved. And he continued until about 1918. And he had different health reasons that caused him to move out of that movement at that time. But even beyond Bell's death, his legacy carried on through oralism. And I think oralism really grew as deaf people resisted it. They expressed themselves through art or through the idea of marrying other deaf people was a form of resistance. And oralism continued and signing continued as parallel ways of being, as parallel methodologies. And so I think that legacy has always been there, truly. Hmm. Can I just add something to clarify for people who might not be aware, might be less aware of these modalities of education? Sign-based education's always included English, um, deaf, children were learning to read and write in English. Um, I think that people think sometimes that sign-based educations had no, no knowledge, like the people who graduated had no knowledge of English and that's not, that's not true. I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Thank you. Um, we have a question, has oralism been phased out of schools or is it still practiced in some schools with different philosophies? Oh no, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> Billy should take that, he looks excited. Oh, it is definitely still practiced. Well, yeah, no, it's definitely still practiced. Maybe more so with cochlear implants, with the spread of cochlear implants. Uh, for a while, ASL, um, there were schools that were really trying to expand and, and use ASL I'd say 1980s, 90s, you saw the growth. And then when cochlear implants came onto the scene, those deaf schools started closing and oralism really took over and it's, it's going strong still today. Can one of you explain cochlear implants, what the technology is just for those who might not 
be familiar? Oh, well, uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm not sure I'd be the right person, but I can give you the basics. It's a surgery uh, that implants a device in the back of the brain. And uh, really, it, uh, there's absolutely no sound that the, that the ear receives after that surgery, but it's an imitation of sound that the brain processes. And we see children being implanted quite young. I'm not... Uh, it's not that those people who are implanted uh, have 100% hearing or have the equivalent of a hearing person, but it's very popular for parents of deaf children to get a cochlear implant. Because of course, if a doctor tells you, look, your child's gonna become hearing, well, who's not gonna believe that and run at, you know, run to go get that? Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Oftentimes, these children are not exposed to sign language. We, we encourage that any child that has a cochlear implant or not, any deaf child be provided access to sign language, have that natural acquisition, that natural exposure. That way they can be bilingual. So if the cochlear implant is something that works well for them, then they're going to be able to use sign language as well, right? ASL and the cochlear implant. So it shouldn't be an either or. Uh, we really encourage both, but that's basically it. Um, Katie, I'll ask you this one. Were Bell's children deaf? He married a deaf woman, so clearly he did not dislike deaf people. What made him take this stance? Was his marriage unhappy? <laughs> um, no. I think on the whole, his marriage was not unhappy. It certainly had moments of tension, like any marriage would, uh, especially during an era with more uh, more gender I don't know uh, yeah it, Mabel was expected to stay home a little bit more and, and he was off giving lectures um, so there was inequity in the marriage based on gender for sure uh, but but maybe less so than in other relationships of the time um, maybe not I'm not sure but Bell's children were hearing. Um, Mabel, his wife, never learned sign language. She was oral until the day she died. Um, she supported oralism until the day she died. She did ultimately come to say that she was, um, she, she came to claim her deafness in a way at the end of her life. But but she remained attached to oralism. Uh, where, I'm sorry, there were a lot of parts to that question. What was something about where his... Um, just if he, if Bell had married a deaf woman, why the discrimination against deaf people and what your right. thoughts were on the motivation for that? I don't think he believed he was discriminating against deaf people. I think he believed he was being helpful. Um, I think there was, always resistance from the very early days within the deaf community. Um, there were people who also were deaf and believed in oralism, but I think he found the resistance confusing was how I, I read it. And he turned away from it. He didn't really inquire what the resistance was, why it was there, what was sign giving deaf children that they weren't finding with oralism, he placed the blame in other places, um, on teachers, on parents, well, less so on parents, but I don't think he believed he was discriminating against deaf people. I think he really thought he was being helpful, which makes him a really complicated figure. It's really hard to know what to do with a legacy like that, except perhaps to do what I think all hearing people should do and really begin an inquiry about what it means to have hearing privilege and what our obligations are in terms of listening more, whatever form that takes. We are almost out of time, but, oh, sorry, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add just a bit to what was said. I mean, Katie, I think what you said is just great in terms of Alexander Graham Bell. He did have a loving marriage, 
And as Katie mentioned, you know, they had their disputes as was wont to happen. And right, Bell was often traveling to go to different places. And he would actually go to deaf conventions or other meetings of scientists, other places. And Mabel was never there. I mean, generally speaking, Mabel didn't join him on those journeys. So Bell would be gone for long periods of time. And, you know, Mabel had some concerns about that. Uh, Bell would come home. Mabel's taking care of a couple of kids, had that sense of where have you been, you know? And I think in some ways, Mabel was trying to show a level of strength as a deaf woman. Like, come home. You have some responsibilities here at home too, to be a part of this family. Um, but I also think when we talk about Alexander Graham Bell, he did fit the mold that we historians talk about and this progressive era. I mean, he was a white, hearing, able-bodied male of a given era. And the way that he felt about other people at that time showed a paternalistic attitude against deaf people, and so again, I don't think he was intending to discriminate against deaf people or to reject them, but his way of helping them, his way of trying to support them did harm to deaf people in a variety of ways. Thank you for that addition, Brian. Um, I wanna get to this final question. How do William and Brian envision the future of ASL and survival of the culture, given the enormity of the influence on hearing parents? Well, what I do know is that ever since the first residential school for the deaf was founded in 1817, we have had 200 years since that founding. That was the American School for the Deaf that was founded in Connecticut. And one thing that I have seen again and again is the strength and the resilience and the ability to persevere that exists in the deaf community and the length of the history that has been true in the face of so many challenges, the enormity of challenges that exist in the fields of education, when we think about employment, the attempts to eliminate signed languages, but to continue to re-innovate, to come up with deaf clubs, to form and build a community and I think that history will guide us that the deaf community will always be there. And honestly, it is remarkable to me when I look at the strength that exists within the deaf community and how much we have been able to adapt to meet the challenges that have occurred over the last 200 years. And I believe that that strength will guide us as we continue into the future. As I had said previously, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I also cannot read the future. Uh, however, before Bell, we had oralism. It was quite predominant in Europe. After Bell, we still have oralism. We've also always had sign language, always, as Brian has said. I'm not sure, well, I definitely would agree. For me, oralism, um, when I think of Bell and his staunch support of oralism, that was more dangerous, did more harm actually than the eugenics movement, his involvement in that, that's my opinion. And we still live with that impact today, even after his death. So I'm not, there are other people that came before him, after him, who have also been staunch supporters of oralism uh, of course, he's the most famous. He's the richest of them all. So it's very hard to really calculate who should we blame? <laughs> it's everyone's responsibility. They're all accountable, right? Uh, for certain. Well, my two cents. Well, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Uh, I'll remind you, Katie's book is called The Invention of Miracles. Um, I encourage you to come visit Planet Word or come to our website, Planet Word museum.org. And thank you, William Ennis. Thank you, Brian Grinwald. Thank you, Katie Booth. Uh, thank you, Rachel and Amanda for your interpretation.
Um, and we look forward to seeing you all at another program soon. <laughs>